the problem that I have with the term knowledge worker being reserved for those people that just sit behind desks and move things around the screens is that laborers and people that do things in the real world, those people still need to have an incredible amount of knowledge to get their job done. All right, welcome back to the podcast, everybody. I am really excited to get started today. One, we are in the temporary studio again, the temporary studio being my office. If you're watching on YouTube, you notice that desk is new from last week. Hannah is once again busy and tied up with actually running the business instead of just making content. So I am back by myself, but I have a banger for you, I promise couple of housekeeping notes. Hannah will be back soon, so be prepared for that. Make sure that you're subscribed for that episode. We'll probably be talking about why she's missing and what she's been doing for the business. Definitely stay tuned for that. Also, we actually did set up the studio, but I'm doing this in my office again because it is easier for me to record these one-man band episodes on my computer than it is to do it in the studio. So that's why I'm doing it like this. Regarding the podcast, I am really, really excited. We have executed on something that we've been thinking about for a really long time, or I've been thinking about for a really long time, which is opening up Q and A's for you to ask. And so if you go to ask at degreefree.co forward slash question, and I'll put it on the screen here, and then I'll be in the podcast notes as usual. Links will be at degreefree.co forward slash podcast, and you can find everything there. But once again, if you go to ask.degreefree.co forward slash question, you can go ahead and ask a question there. The reason why we did it this way is because we have a lot of inbound. We have a lot of contact forms coming in. People email us at contact at degreefree.co. And it's just a little hard to go through everything and get to everything. Some things are business requests. Some things are people asking about like, what do you do or how much you charge for this or whatever. And then some people are like, hey, hey, I have a podcast episode. And we didn't have a really good way of putting all these things into the correct buckets. So we figure if we go this route, it'll automatically be in this bucket. So if you have a question that you would like answered on the podcast, go to ask.degreefree.co forward slash question and ask your question there. So I threw it together today. It's V1, but I'd like to get your questions there. The way that the questions are going to work is they are going to be in either video or audio format. So if you have a question, you can ask by sending us a video, something that you record on your phone prior, and then you can upload it. Or if you go to that URL, you can go on your mobile phone or computer and you can go ahead and ask your question. Video is best so we can see your face, but there's also audio as well. We're doing it with the video and audio because we want to make it a little bit more personable. We want to make it actually you instead of me saying Mike from Indiana is asking whatever. Instead of that, it's your voice and you are actually asking us a question and then we can answer it on the podcast or on the TikTok or wherever else. So definitely ask.degreefree.co for slash question. I am really looking forward to hearing your questions. And so, you know, now we do get a lot of inbound and I'm hoping that all of you use it, but just because you submit a question doesn't mean we'll automatically answer it. We're going to go and compile it. And we're thinking about doing maybe one episode a month or maybe an extra episode is where we'll go through these questions and we'll, and we'll answer them. Definitely go there and submit your questions. I am really, 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 really looking forward to it. What I wanted to start with today is, you know, what's wrong with this country is that Everyone can point out problems really easy, but most people don't have like any solutions. So it's just a bunch of people complaining. And today for this segment, I'm not going to be any different. I just have complaints to lodge and I kind of sort of have solutions that I kind of need your help uh, coming up with a solution. And we'll get to that in a second, at least for this segment. I have a really actionable thing to get into right after this, but I wanted to talk about this because this irritated me. So I started rereading the book, The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker. If anybody knows that book, it's like business 101 or business person 101 as far as how to make decisions and how to manage people, how to manage decision making and that whole process. 
And I came across a term, quote, knowledge worker. I absolutely hate that term. I hated it so much that I kind of just stopped reading and then I went down this really big rabbit hole, which is what I'm gonna share with you right now. He uses this term in the 1950s and the 1960s to talk about the trend that he saw in the labor market and the overall economy as a whole, right? He said that it was implementation of theoretical and analytical knowledge within organizations and industries that would drive them forward, which is and was absolutely true. Theoretical and analytical knowledge within organizations and industries would drive them forward. Yeah, I can't argue with that, sure. The bone that I have to pick with him is just about the use of knowledge worker, right? By using those terms, he created a false dichotomy that the binary distinction between like knowledge and labor is made up and misleading, right? So a lot of people know the term knowledge worker, but I'll just kind of sum it up for you here. Knowledge worker are people that sit behind desks and move things on screens, right? whereas labor is people that do things and affect things in the world. The problem that I have with the term knowledge worker being reserved for those people that just sit behind desks and move things around the screens is that laborers and people that do things in the real world, those people still need to have an incredible amount of knowledge to get their job done. Hey there, I hope that you're loving this episode of the Degree Free Podcast. We spend a ton of time every week creating this content for you. So my only ask is you take a quick second to leave a review or a thumbs up on whatever platform you're on. It's one of the best and easiest ways that you can support this podcast. And this simple action can help bring more people into the Degree Free community. At Degree Free, we wanna help as many people as we can thrive and succeed without needing a college degree. Your review will be a step in that direction. If you could do this small favor right now, pause this and leave a review. It would truly mean the world to us. Thank you. And back to the show. I've done both of these styles of jobs in my own life. I was a firefighter. And before that I was a handyman for years. And now I don't do any work in the physical world. I just rant about things online, like how I'm doing right now. But when I was a firefighter, I remember the first time I cut someone out of a car. Right? And I think back to that, like, did that take knowledge to do? Like, yeah, that absolutely took knowledge to do, to do it safely, to do it efficiently, to make sure that we didn't injure the patient any more than they were already injured, to make sure that we didn't cut something we weren't supposed to cut, to make sure that the car didn't crumple or act in a way that we didn't want it to act. It took highly specialized knowledge to know how to cut the car. Like you make this cut first, then you make this cut and then you make this cut and then you're not injuring the person or the patient or yourself any further. That's super, super knowledgeable. So that's a little bit of an extreme. But I remember when I was a handyman, I'm terrible, terrible at electrical work. Absolutely terrible. I don't understand it at all. AC, DC, it's a band. AC, DC is a band to me. I remember I was interviewing to work with this guy, it's pretty funny. I was interviewing to work with this guy and he was a true blue handyman. He kind of did everything and he did everything, including electrical work. He brought me on for a job for one day. That was my interview. My interview was eight hours of work with him for a day. And so, perfect, let's do this. We go to the house that we're working on and there's like seven jobs that need to be done. And he's just like, okay, well, why don't you install the dishwasher? And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. I was like, I can absolutely install the dishwasher. I get to the dishwasher or where the dishwasher cutout's supposed to be. I thought he was asking me to put the dishwasher into the unit, screw it in, plug it in and, and all that good. What he meant was why don't you go and wire the dishwasher? Cause it needs an outlet. It doesn't have an under the sink outlet when you gotta wire that up. I got there and I was just like, Oh, okay. Well, I got two options here. I can either totally fake it and just do something and, and just see if it works. Or I can ask him and just tell him like, Hey, I don't know what's going on here, but I felt like if I did that, the interview would pretty much just be over and he wouldn't want to work with me. So I did the first thing and I just did whatever. There was three wires. I 
did something with it. It sparked, it shut things down. And I was just like, oh man. So I had to call him anyway. Cause he was just like, what just happened? Long story short, I didn't get the job. <laughs> Long story short, I was correct. He was like, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> he was like, he was like, it's like, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> this interview's over, which is exactly what I thought was going to happen. If I had just told him that I didn't know what I was doing, I just thought it, the interview would have been over. And I might not have been because I was honest, but because I wasn't honest and I almost burned the house down, it definitely was over then. But anyway, you see, that was labor. And just because I was doing labor didn't mean that I didn't need knowledge. The word choice that he used there alienated and divided a whole generation of people, right? We've got to remember that this was the 1950s and the 1960s when he first coined this term. And I think it was actually in another book that wasn't the effective executive. I did this in my research, but I forgot to write, write it down here. It was like in his first book, or, or I think he co-authored it with somebody and he was quoted as knowledge worker or something like that. But this was the 50s and 60s. And this was like pivotal work at the time. And I don't think I'm giving him too much credit when I say that I think it had a great deal to do with why we've devalued trades and labor over the past few decades, words matter. I'm saying knowledge worker, would you rather be a knowledge worker or would you rather be a laborer or would you rather be anything else other than a knowledge worker? I don't know. I would probably would want to be a knowledge worker. Like, yeah, I think so too. Cause I don't want to be a dummy. I want to have knowledge. Like, yeah, me too. But like I said, those two stories, if I needed knowledge to cut somebody out of the car and I didn't have knowledge of electrical wiring. And so, yeah, you definitely need knowledge for labor work. Anyway, that is my little rant for today to make this a little bit more useful. And, you know, listening to this, that we really care about overtaking the narrative and really think about the different words that we use, because we don't want these words to just be forced and thrust upon us, which is why this whole movement is called degree free. We don't say college dropout. Everybody else says that. We're not going to let the colleges define who we are in a negative sense. And so college breakout, you plain old just didn't go, which is great. You broke out of college. Awesome. College age kids, young adults. We have to take back the language, we have to take back the narrative. So I couldn't think of any good names, but I need help thinking of names. So when I thought about it, what do these types of jobs really do? They work in some sort of virtual space. I'm talking about the knowledge workers. What do these jobs really do? They work in some sort of virtual space. Accountants move numbers on a spreadsheet. Developers create magic in a screen. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in today's term. Like when I say virtual, I just mean something that is you know, not necessarily in the physical world. Like when I think of accountant, I actually don't think of a modern day accountant. Whenever I think of accountant, I think of like Scrooge and him like Ebenezer Scrooge, just like rah, being pissed and going over the accounts and telling people to stop Christmas carol, like singing Christmas carols and things like that. That's what I think of. And that is also virtual because his job is in that spreadsheet. Although that spreadsheet isn't digital with that guideline. I went to my assistant, my assistant is ChatGPT, and I have a few names that I would like to bring to the court. And if you could let me know in the comments on YouTube, that'd be great. Or Spotify. Now they have comments on Spotify. I don't know if you knew that, but yeah, you could do that as well. I probably spent too much time on this to be completely honest, but this is the type of gold that you get at the Degree Free Podcast. Instead of going to sleep or instead of reading the effective executive, to tell me that this was not an effective use of my time to go down this rabbit hole and then to come and spend 30 minutes talking to you about this rabbit hole. I said, screw that, here we are. And so this is the goal that you get at the Degree Free Podcast. Here are the three best names that my assistant came up with. One, digital professionals or digital workers. That's kind of so-so. Two is gonna be virtual workers, right? kind of working in that virtual environment again. Three is intangible laborers. Nah, I don't really like that one, but I see its point. I couldn't think of anything better than that. So I, I had to go to chat GPT. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. Now here are two funny ones or what I thought was funny. How funny can you really be talking about 
knowledge worker alternatives. So the first one is abstraction al alchemists. I like that. I never would have thought about that. And the second one that I really liked, this was actually buried in the list, was imagination engineers. I like this one a lot. And I like this one a lot because it's really, really close to Imagineers, like the people that work at Disney, like the engineers that work at Disney. And so it'd be cool to use this one and see how long it takes before the Mickey Mouse legal team comes after us for it. And I'll just, whoever says like, yes, I'll just make sure that they knock on your door to give you the cease and desist. I really like Imagination Engineers, but I don't know. The Mickey Mouse legal team, the Disney legal team, I think they've been resting on their laurels because earlier this month, Mickey Mouse, the original one, he just came into the public domain. So Mickey Mouse is alive and well, or he's free at least, and you can do whatever you want with the likeness, at least of that original Mickey Mouse all the way back then in 31 or something like that. That one is like, you can make Mickey Mouse do whatever. You can put Mickey Mouse on Mars if you want. But anyway, that is the first portion of that. Help me come up with an alternative to knowledge workers, right? So go over it again digital professionals or digital workers, virtual workers, intangible laborers, abstraction alchemists, and then come after us, Disney, imagination engineers is gonna round out the top five. Let us know in the YouTube comments. Let us know in Spotify as well. Moving on so that I can get something actually useful to you this week. I have been doing a lot of work on updating our frameworks for learning new skills. When you're signing up to go degree free, you're basically saying like, okay, I'm going to be a lifelong learner. I am signing up for the rest of my life to continuously learn new skills as I see that I need them. We had a framework around learning skills quickly, but it really wasn't working for us when we were using it ourselves. And then when we were telling other people, this is how to learn different skills. And this could be any skill. I mean, this could be from how to use a hammer to, you know, how to code. I was updating the framework for learning new skills internally. And when I was doing it, I was like, oh, you know what? This is a super useful for other people. At least I think it is. And so I'm going to talk about it. The first month of the year is pretty much over. I know a lot of people are looking for new jobs and a lot of people that have kids in high school that are seniors, your kids are about to be graduating soon. And you're starting to think, how do I learn new skills? How does my child learn new skills? And I wanted to talk about this framework that we have because we are constantly, constantly, constantly learning new skills. You might already know Hannah's story. She learned Salesforce. She had business analyst certs, business operation skills, and she's constantly learned new skills to level up in her career. And personally, for me, I've held all different types of jobs. My entire career has been me learning new skills. And now that I'm a business owner and a business operator, I am constantly learning new skills. Like I don't know anything and I am constantly learning new skills. And, and for those business owners listening or those that are high up in small businesses, like one to five people operations. I mean like high up, like you're two of two in your business operations, like it's the owner and then you, you'll know what I'm talking about. You'll know that you wear a lot of hats and then somebody's like, I think we should do this. And you're like, well, I don't know how to do that. I'm like, well, let's figure it out. And so you have to learn new skills. So I'm constantly learning new skills. And this is the framework we use to think about acquiring skills fast. And it's also what we use in our personal life. And it's what we tell our clients to skill up quickly as well. Now, before we get into the actual framework, I did want to say that this is just a framework to learn the skill, not how to identify which skill to learn. So to give an example, Let's say that I want to get a job in marketing running Google ads. By the way, if this is you, go back and listen to my episode with James Stewart. I'll put links in the description, degreefree.co forward slash podcast. He walks you through exactly how to do this thing, which is getting a job in marketing running Google ads. This is exactly what he walks you through. But let's just say that that's the skill that you want to have. You want to learn how to do Google ads. There are two things that you have to do, and this could be any skill. You have to identify the skills necessary to learn 
to land that Google ads job, right? So that's number one, identify the skills necessary to learn. And step number two is learn the skills you've identified. I'm gonna be going over bullet point number two. If you want me to do an episode on bullet point number one, please let me know in the YouTube comments or Spotify comments. You can also go back and listen to episode 78 of the podcast, pretty sure it's 78, I'll put in the show notes, how to find a job backwards, which is basically what I'm talking about for step one, which is how to identify it. So now that we have that cleared up and we're just talking about learning the skills you've identified, you know that you have to learn Google ads. So how am I gonna learn them? I'll give you the whole framework now and we'll talk about them individually. We call them the three S's to learn new skills. The self-study, structured study, and supported study. So before we get into each one individually, I did wanna take another pause here and just say, when you're actually learning skills, you have to identify skills and then you have to learn skills. We are currently in that second part, step two. Within step two, there are sub points to learning the skills. To break down the actual learning of skills, there are another two parts. So it's 2A and 2B if you wanna think about it like that. The first one is you want to curate the learning material. So you have to figure out what is it that I'm actually going to learn and what is it that's going to teach me. You're gonna curate the learning materials that you're going to use. The second is actually learn the material that you've curated. Those are two separate tasks, but we'll talk about those things right now. With all of these things, self-study, structured study, supported study, you can't get around step number two. The whole point is to learn the material. The only time that you're really going to get around it, and it's in quotes, is if you are like a business owner or you have like a deliverable and you can pay somebody to just do that deliverable for you, but then you're not really learning skills. So I did want to just talk about that briefly, where this is differentiated is really in step number one and between step number one and step number two. So here we go. Self-study. That is using free resources to teach yourself. This requires you to do both. One, curate the learning material and two, learn the material, right? So some examples would be YouTube or free Udemy courses, searching Reddit and Google for free resources is really, really, really helpful. So if you're trying to learn Google ads or you're trying to learn whatever, what insert, whatever it is, you wanna build tiny homes and you don't know how to draw up tiny homes, you can Google tiny homes making Reddit and you would be surprised on how much is there and listed out and itemized for you to learn and then do. So Google, Reddit, YouTube, Udemy courses, those are just some examples, but really it doesn't really matter. It's all self-study. Books also fall into this category. They're not free, but they're cheap for what you can get out of it. And it's still self-study because you still have to curate that book. And most books aren't comprehensive. And so while it's while it's good, it's good information, when it comes to like implementing it and learning it, it's not gonna be super helpful. So the pros of self-study is that it's the cheapest by far. Most of it's free. If not, it's a book, $30, less than $100, usually in self-study. The second thing is that what's great is that you can customize exactly what you learn. So instead of just broadly talking about Google ads, you could just learn how to test titles of Google ads or just test copy of Google ads or just test images of Google ads, something like that. You could take a course or find a resource or a blog article that is just about what metrics do I need to learn first for Google ads, something like that. So you can really customize exactly what you need to learn. So that that is a pro, it just takes time, which is a con. So moving on to the cons is that there's no accountability, there's no support, and there's no structure. Because like I said, you are responsible for building it and curating all this material yourself. I use this all the time, as I'm sure that you do this as well. But when I was first starting to learn how to do photography and videography, I didn't have a lot of money. And the money that I did have, I wanted to put it towards new gear, or at least new to me, used gear. As any photographer or videographer knows, like, especially when you're first starting out, 
all you want is more gear. You think that more gear will make you a better photographer and videographer, which just isn't true when you start to get into it. Like anything else, sure, gear helps. But the main thing is knowing how to use the gear, understanding the terms, how to use your camera, how to frame shots, how to tell stories, how to edit. That's really what matters. But I was too busy spending money on gear because I thought, oh, well, that's what I can do right now. I can buy all these fancy cameras. I can buy all these fancy lights or whatever it was, a gimbal or whatever. But I didn't want to spend any money on actually figuring out how to use it. So I went the self-study route of teaching myself how to do all of these things. I used all kinds of free and cheap resources to learn what to do at the beginning. I watched Peter McKinnon, Parker Walbeck at the time. These are YouTubers that talk about this type of stuff. I don't watch them anymore. I bought a guide for my camera, not my guide that came with the camera, but somebody wrote like, your camera for dummies. I forget exactly what the model was, but you know, your camera for dummies. And I was just like, yeah, sure. Sounds good. So I read, I read that thing and I was testing out my new skills, learning them. Then I would run into the next skill that I didn't know. And then I'd go and learn that. And I would do that all through self-study. So all of my experience from photography and videography, that's it was all self-taught. It was all through YouTube and free courses. I know that I haven't spent any money on any YouTube courses or content creation courses or anything like that. Everything that I've done with Premiere, everything that I've done with videography, everything I've done with Photoshop, I've all learned through self-study. And I've done paid gigs for photography and videography. If you have more time than money, this is usually where you're going to start out. You're going to start with the self-study range. Like, Let's go back to the Google ads example. If you don't have money for a course, you're going to pay for it in your time in figuring out and tracking down all of these resources to then learn these skills. And this is usually the course that we tell people to take first. Take a free course, watch YouTube videos, see if you like it first, see if it's actually what you need to know. Take it. You might learn everything that you need to know right there. You check that skill off onto the next, but you might find that, wow, this is really, really complicated. I should buy a more structured course, right? So let's say you wanted to learn how to make a short story or a short film, and you go and you look at a YouTube course of how to make a short film and you don't know anything. They start all the way at, here's how to do a story. And they're like, yeah, you shoot it from this angle, this angle, this angle. And you're like, I don't even know how to turn the camera on. And so you have to go all the way to the back. And that's where you start to run into, well, having a little bit more structure would really be helpful here. And so that goes into our second part, which is structured study. And that's using a structured course to guide you through the process. The second S takes care of the first part, curate your learning material, right? This takes care of it for you. It's curating it for you. It's structuring it for you. So you can focus on that second step, which is actually learning the material. So some examples of this is going to be massive open online courses, Coursera, Udemy, things of that nature. And then like niche course providers as well. Those are some examples of structured study. Pros for this is, well, the structure. Everything is laid out for you. You just have to focus on learning the material. The good thing about this as well is they're usually pretty affordable. This is the next tier up as far as cost goes as well. And so they're still pretty affordable. You can't really put a price on it. Some courses cost thousands of dollars and some courses cost $9. It just depends. But this is just structured study. And you can tell that it's just structured study because of the cons. The cons is that it has no or limited accountability and no or limited support for a lot of these massive open online courses that you get through Udemy or some other provider. There's no accountability. There's nobody asking you, Hey, how are you doing? Are you making sure that you're staying on course and that you are watching all of and learning all of the materials at this pace? Like they'll try to give you a calendar that says, well, most people, 
people finish this section within a week. They'll try to give you a calendar to do that, but it's on yourself to hold yourself to that standard. And then also these structured studies, they lack support or most of them do. And the reason why is because they're affordable and support costs money. When you are looking for answers to specific questions that you have, it's a lot more difficult. You're still going to have to go to Google or now you go to ChatGPT or Bard or something like that. And you can ask it the specific question that you have. And you're like, Hey, I ran this Google ad and it did this, or I don't understand this term and this, 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 what can I do? So you're still going to have to do the legwork over there. This one brings it about even you are paying less of your time because you don't have to curate the material right? That first step, that whole first step is completely done for you. Curate the materials that's out the door. You pay to get your time back. This is exactly what you need to learn. Perfect. Awesome. Now I just need to do step two, which I need to learn the material. So you lower your time commitment and then, but you increase the amount that you pay. So this is similar to the job change accelerator for those that know what that is. Hannah and I created a course to help job seekers and career changers change their life by changing their work. Right. And it didn't come with support because it was always in the $99 or $250 range. And for that amount of money, we couldn't offer support to everyone that bought it. We just couldn't do it because like I said, support is expensive. But with that, if you followed it to the T, you would change jobs. It was all laid out in front of you. You just had to learn the skills of being a good job seeker. We curated all the materials for you and packaged it up and gave it to you. You just had to do it. But then there was no or limited accountability and there was no or limited support, but structure, everything that you need. Two, it was very affordable. Then you just implement those skills. You learn whatever it is and you implement those skills. We actually don't sell that course anymore. So don't go and look for it or anything like that. It's not up for everybody that bought it still. I mean, you can still go and access it obviously, but we're not selling any new ones of them. We might in the future, but I just wanted to use that as an example of like structured study, right? You wanna learn the skills of being a good job seeker. Here it is for you, just gotta learn it. The last S is going to be supported study. And the defining characteristic of supported study is the support. You get everything you get with structured study, but you also get accountability and support. So examples could be boot camps, one-on-one coaching, cohort and group coaching. Those are all examples of supported study. The pros of this is that, well, you have the accountability, you have the support and you have the structure. You have everything that you need to succeed. The con is that it's the most expensive because like we said, support is expensive. And I wanted to pause here and kind of think about it. Usually when learning new skills, we suggest kind of working your way up the ladder unless you have more money than time. And so what I mean by working up the ladder is start with the self-study, then move on to the structured study. Then if you need it, go to the supported study, especially if you have more time than money. If you don't have a lot of money, do it that way. Let's just say that you make $60,000 a year right now, but you only spend $30,000 a year. So every year you have a $30,000 surplus. So, and you're like, well, I could go the self-study, structured study, supported study and figure out that way. Maybe I'll knock it out of the park with self-study at first. Boom, maybe it's done. But then you're like, well, I would rather just pay somebody because I know my own learning habits and, and I know that I just, I would rather show up and have somebody tell me to show up, have somebody support me throughout it and all those things. And so if you have more money than time, you know, supported study is the way to go, or it's like, it's probably the best way to go because then you can at least ask questions along the way. Like boot camps, one-on-one coaching, cohort group coaching. Those are really good examples of supported study. You still have the structure. They still do all of number one for you. They still curate the learning materials. You still have to do number two, which is learn the skills. But while you are doing number two, you have somebody there to 
bolster what it is that you are learning and then check your comprehension. So throughout these boot camps, you have somebody usually that you can ask like, hey, am I doing this right? Is this the right thing I'm doing or should I be doing this differently? Things of that nature. And this is more similar to what we're doing now with the degree free launch program. We haven't talked about it too much. I'll wait to talk about it when Hannah's here because that's one of the reasons why she's not here right now. But just to kind of use an example, like we're teaching people the skill to create custom career roadmaps to get the work they want to fulfill their life goals, right? We're mostly working with younger people, ages 16 to 20 years old. We, we take all applicants, but it has everything because it's one-on-one, -on -one, it has accountability, it has support, it has structure but it's the most expensive thing that we've done by far because it has all of those things. From a business perspective, from somebody that's providing these types of services and these types of study, I mean, we couldn't do one-on-one -on -one at a $250 price point. We couldn't even do it at an $1,100 price point. Now, with this being the most expensive that we've ever done, it is the most expensive, but it's also the high white glove service, which is what you get in supported study. For those that want to check it out, degreefree.co forward slash launch. Like I said, we're not really talking about it right now, but we'll talk about it, I'm sure, probably next week now that I'm talking about it. But those are the three S's of learning a new skill. I wanted to go over the two most common pitfalls that I have had with learning new skills and that other people have had that I have helped learn new skills with. The first one is going to be never committing to your learning materials. Right? It's getting stuck between step one and step two, right? So to rewind before the three S's, what does it take to learn a skill? It takes the curation of learning materials and then you have to learn those materials. One of the biggest problems that I have and that people have that I've worked with in learning new skills is not committing to the thing that you're learning right now. Those two things, the reason why I put them into two steps is because they are two distinct tasks. Once you curate your learning materials, you have curated them. You have selected them. Stop selecting. Learn it now. You've moved on. You've moved on from that skill and you just have to learn that material, learn that skill. And then when you're done, you can go back and learn something else or whatever. For this, an example would be, but let's just say that we are trying to make a wooden box, maybe something like a Kleenex or a tissue box holder, something like that. I don't even know if people use tissue boxes anymore, but like a tissue box holder. And you go and you say, this is the blueprint that I'm gonna learn to do this. You should just go and do that. Learn that skill once you have selected it. There's like five options in front of you for the different ways to make a Kleenex box holder. Pick one, learn that. The worst thing that we can do is that we can pick one, halfway learn it, and then we go back and we go like, ah, oh, maybe I should have picked one of these other four. Ah, you know what? Grab this one. Let's do this. And then you start all over and then you do that. And then you never finish the thing that you're working on. That is the number one thing that I have done wrong in this. And I, and I still struggle with this to today because how do you know if you're choosing the right thing? That's why you have to curate it and then learn it. So just commit once you've curated it. The second thing with learning new skills is learning two skills at once. So it's similar, but different. What I mean by this is this, so let's go back to our Kleenex box example. What we did just then is we got two different instructions or two different learning materials to do the same thing, to learn the same skill, to get the same outcome. That is not committing to your learning materials. What I'm talking about in the second one is saying, oh, well, I wanna make a tissue box holder here, and then I also wanna make a birdhouse here. And so I'm going to pick the learning materials to do the Kleenex box. And then I'm going to halfway do that. Okay. While I'm doing that, I'm also going to figure out which learning materials I need to build the birdhouse. And then I'm going to start on that. I'm going to build them concurrently. I'm going to build them at the same time. So my Kleenex box is getting built and my birdhouse is getting built. That is terrible. That is terrible. We want to do one thing at a time, get your birdhouse built, get your Kleenex box built, whichever one's first, and then go do the other one. You're going to find that it is much quicker to single task one thing, learn it, knock that domino down, and then learn the next thing. 
Also, what you might find is that when you learn that first skill, it might be enough to get you to wherever it is that you want to go. So let's just say that you wanted to get a job and you did the how to find a job backwards methodology and you were looking at all these skills and you have like one skill, two skill, three skill that you have to learn. You might find that if you just learn that one skill and you start applying to jobs, you might get the job. And so you don't really have to learn two and three, or at least you don't have to learn it right now because the whole reason that you're learning the skill is to get the job. So for people that are looking to learn skills specifically to job hunt, I'm talking to you, especially with this learning two skills at one time, learn one skill, don't lose sight of the goal, which is to get a job. The goal isn't actually to learn the skill. It's to learn the skill to get a job and learn that one skill, put it on your resume and then start applying to jobs. For those people that are just trying to learn the skill to learn the skill, let's say like you need to learn this skill, whatever it is, you know, you need to learn how to hold your breath underwater. You got, you got to learn it. And then you got to learn the rest of it as well. The other part of that is that you might find that that first skill is good enough and can stand in for that second one. So let's just say this is a bad example, but I can't think of anything else right now, but let's just say that that Kleenex box can also function as a birdhouse, but you would have never gotten to that point. Had you learned both skills at the same time, you would not have had that clarity that you have now. And you're like, yeah, well this Kleenex box absolutely can function as a birdhouse here. Well, let's just put it up in the tree. Boom. We're done half of the year. It's a birdhouse. And then half the year it's a Kleenex box. And so that is pretty much it for this week. Before you go, make sure if you have any questions, go to ask.degreefree.co forward slash question. And please leave a video. That'd be best. I want to see your face. As usual, before you go, let me know how you like this in the comments, YouTube, Spotify. Go, you can just tell me how you liked it if you go to ask at .degreefree.co forward slash question if you want to do that there. Show notes, degreefree.co forward slash podcast. And that is pretty much it for this week, guys. Let me know how you liked it. Until next week, along.